right. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to see you. I have three quick things for you this morning. Uh, the first is, I don't know if you know, but uh, Christmas Eve is coming up this week. So we are going to celebrate as a church family. We have two services, 3 and 5 p.m. So come to whichever one you want, live stream whichever one you want. But we also want to remind you, we mentioned this last week, that as you exit the service today, we have an invite bag for you, okay? And here's our ask, is that you would prayerfully consider who you might invite to our Christmas Eve service. Maybe it's a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, and it's 2020, I get it. Celebrate Christmas Eve however you feel inclined, all right? So we've tried during 2020 to have this kind of posture as a church of permission, not pressure. So you're welcome to be here. You're welcome to be in the room. You're welcome to watch online. And maybe your invitation might even look like inviting a neighbor or a friend over to watch the Christmas Eve service with you. However you do it, you have our blessing, but leverage this time to, uh, to share Christmas Eve with a friend or a neighbor. The second thing I have for you this morning is uh, she was in first service. Elisa Bosenberg has served us as our children's director, and she is transitioning back to where her family is at in Tampa. But I wanted to just publicly thank her for her ministry here. So even though she's not in the service, this service is being live streamed online. Can we just clap for Elisa and just thank her for, for her love for, stu for kids and how she's served. So today is a special Sunday. I have been looking forward to this Sunday because we are concluding our series on embracing adventurous faith in a special way. We have brought in to conclude the series Brent Crow. And Brent Crow, this is not hyperbole, he, he has been one of my favorite speakers of all time. He is the vice president of Student Leadership University. He has traveled the country speaking to hundreds of thousands of people. I think he's on his sixth book right now. His most recent one is one called Moments Till Midnight. And uh, in light of all the professional stuff he's got going on, he just adopted three kids, which brings his total with, that he and his wife share to six. So he is a very busy guy, and we are blessed to have him this morning. I remember um, going up to Brent at a conference. It was a fairly large conference to equip ministry leaders. And I think it was the third time I had heard him speak. And I went up to him, and I just why not? So I, I go up to Brent and I said, hey, I, I've been just blessed by your ministry publicly. And I don't know if you do this kind of thing, but if I could have like an hour of your time to come ask you questions about ministry and, 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 and just hear some of your thoughts on speaking and teaching and ministry, that would be a blessing to me. Can we grab lunch? And, and he says, yeah, well, let's just get it on the calendar. And, and, uh, and I got to go and spend an hour with Brent and just and hear from him. And so I have been blessed uh, as one of your pastors by Brent publicly and personally. And so it's kind of a joy for me to be able to share him with you today. And so Edgewater Alliance, would you join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Brent Crow? Good morning. There's a lot to live up to. That's all I can. I promise you, I will uh, try to. That was an overpromise uh, and then uh, underdeliver type introduction. This is going to be like that uh, grandma that gives the ugly Christmas sweater out to the kid type thing after that introduction. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, you know who you are, grandmothers. We love you, anyways. All right, so. Well, good morning. My name's Brent, and uh, I'm so honored to be uh, able to come in at the tail end of a, a really cool series, theme, topic, whatever you want to call it, this idea of embracing adventurous faith, because I believe it is the paradigm by which we are to live and understand what it means to actually be a disciple of Jesus. 
And but this is uh, also obviously a great, great week. This is the season in which we celebrate the, the the baby who split history in two, right? I mean, this is this is Emmanuel, God with us this week, and and so you you we are. I'm a big fan of Advent. If you don't know what that means, I didn't either for a long time. It's just a fancy word that means waiting <laughs> and anticipating and looking forward. To. And so we're in what would be called a season of Advent. We're, we're awaiting Christmas morning in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus, i.e. the incarnation, and the fact that God is now with us. Uh, or as Eugene Peterson wrote in the message that he put skin on and moved into the neighborhood of humanity, right? Which is one of my favorite ways of, of, of understanding it. But, but it's, it's, this is, this is Advent season. And for so many years, in fact, you could almost say all of the Old Testament was kind of an Advent season in and of itself. There was a, a great, beautiful world that was created. <laughs> and it was awesome and it was perfect. And, Adam and Eve were placed in it, and then five minutes later, you know, they 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 kicked over the toys and threw a hissy fit and and got themselves kicked out of the garden. But on the way out, God made a promise, didn't he? And, and in Genesis 3:15 is, is is this promise that there will be a descendant of Eve, and 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 she, that descendant will will stomp the head of the serpent. And there's this idea of, of war being declared between good and evil at that moment and a promise that there was one who was going to come who was going to get us out of the mess that we got ourselves into. And that promise is, never changes, though the circumstances around it are constantly in flux all throughout the Old Testament. I mean, the promise would get on a boat, you know, with Noah, and and then you know there would be this uh, this event with Abraham, in which it's like, hey, I know you're really old, and I know she's kind of old too, uh, but you guys are gonna have some kids, and and I mean, and then there's out of that would come these descendants and then eventually there would be the tribe of the 12 tribes of, of Israel and and then they would get hungry because of famine and they would kind of be mean to one of the brothers and he would go live in Egypt as a slave but then he would become a ruler and then 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 all the tribes would need to eat and so Egypt would give safe harbor to all of the tribes of Israel and then unfortunately when they were full and they were feeling pretty good they started to have a lot of babies and and then this 12 tribes of Israel this family became two million people <laughs> over several hundred years and and then the Pharaoh of Egypt is like there's a lot of labor here that could be used and so he made them into slaves and they had to get delivered and there's Moses and all of this has to do with a promise then we move into the period of judges and and, and we got all of this has to do with a promise that there was one who was coming. They would remember the promise, forget the promise, rebel against the promise, worship false gods, rediscover the promise. And it was almost like it was rinse and repeat throughout much of the Old Testament. But Isaiah said it, I think, most succinctly. That, it, that a son would be given and a child would be born. Son speaks to his deity, that he has existed from eternity past. He has no beginning and he has no end. Child speaks to his humanity, that the word, as John would say in John 1, the word became flesh. And so I've taught it to my children this way, that, that God with us, Emmanuel, the incarnation, what Christmas is all about is that he was all man and he was all God, but he is all one. It might be appropriately said that Jesus is the only 200% being ever to exist. All man, 100% man, 100% God, all one. And it literally changed everything. So if, 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 if we are in a season of Advent, that's what we try to do between Thanksgiving and Christmas every year, we anticipate the birth of Jesus as an act of worship. 
And, 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 and it's a good tradition to have. If you've never done it, it's not like you're a bad Christian, but you probably should try it sometime. It's, it's a great tradition. And, and it's never too late, by the way, to start. Right? Like, well, what's, what's, it's December 20th. Is that right? 20th? 20th? Somebody nod? Yes? The kid in the front row. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Could have been like the 30th. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Anyways, uh, I'm going with whatever you say, though, for the rest of the day. All right, so, but it's, we got five days till Christmas. It's not too late to start anticipating. It is never too late to anticipate the goodness of God. And, and, and so this promise, this really long season of Advent is the Old Testament. And then we have the, the realization of the promise, the fulfillment of the promise, which is Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel. And, and he, he was not born to be a baby. It was declared primarily in Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew to give more detail than any of the other Gospels, but he was declared out of the gate to be the Savior. Right? He was, he was born to be the Savior of the world. And so we have this This promise that was fulfilled through Jesus, the incarnation that changed history, that split history in two. And and so now we, here we are today, we live as benefactors of that promise. Or if if you went to, you know, if you go to small group of Sunday school enough, you know, the new covenant. We live as benefactors of the promise. We live under the new covenant and we are awaiting not the day of redemption that has happened. We are awaiting another day and that is the day of restoration. And it is a real day. Can I just say that again? It is a real day in which God is going to make all things new again. Again? Oh yeah. The beginning of the story and the end of the story are going to look an awful lot alike. He's going to restore new heavens, new earth. He's going to restore all of his creation as it once was. And so we are awaiting that day, living under the benefit, benefit, excuse me, of the promise that was fulfilled, starting in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, seen all throughout the Old Testament, realized in the Messiah, and now awaiting the day in which God, as a friend of mine says this day, this way, there is a real day on God's calendar when he's going to blow the whistle and call all the kids out the pool, right? That, that, like there is this real day when he's going to go, enough is enough. And I'm going to make everything new again. Now, in that, how do we adventure? Does, I mean, does 2020 feel like a fun year to go, let's go on an adventure? It doesn't to me. I mean, it just, 2020 feels like a... a like somebody got drunk and took the wheel. I mean, that's what it feels like. And here, here's the deal. Like this is, this, this, this is, this is a bad year. Can we just say it's a bad year? Some of you are going, oh, there are no bad days because every day the Lord has given his mercies are new. No, no. Hey, listen to me. The mercies of God are new every day. But don't tell someone dying of cancer that it's just the best day of their life. There are moments that we endure. And in the moments that we endure, we experience the sufficiency of Christ in a way that we never could in the moments that we just enjoy. Ask someone that's been through it. They know something about Jesus that the rest of us probably don't. And so how... Do we adventure well? Another way for saying adventure, and the reason I said this is the paradigm for discipleship is, is, because, um, is because we were created for, for pilgrimage. That's an old-fashioned word. But we were created to be sojourners. We were created to wander. The Old Testament writer, the psalmist, wrote it this way. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, Lord, and whose, whose, whose hearts are set on the highway 
or whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, depending on what translation you read. It could also be translated who have the highways on their hearts. We were, listen to me, church, this morning, please. If you don't get anything else, just hear this little thing from a little nobody. We were created to go on a journey. And the, the dysfunction of our lives, the, the, the tension that should never exist, the confusion that should never exist always happens when we get confused about our residence. If we get too comfortable thinking this is life, then we forget that our home is actually the heavenly country. We don't have a permanent address here. We have a traveling address because we're going there. And that's the whole Bible. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So the question I want to ask and hopefully answer this morning very briefly is this, because that was the world's longest introduction, is this. How do we, with just a handful of days before Christmas, how do we wander well knowing and believing that God is with us. And I want to answer that by turning, if we could, for just a moment, uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you have a copy of God's Word, I like it, I use it, I'm a fan. And so if you have a copy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read to you two verses, but we're going to primarily just focus on one. Uh, most of you under, know the context of 2 Timothy. It's, his, it's, it's Paul's last letter. He's about, he's about to die himself. In fact, he's going to say it in the verse that we're about to read. But he was imprisoned in a dungeon. There was this crazy man who was the emperor uh, at that time. And uh, when I say he was crazy, he was, he was a psychotic idiot because this guy thought himself to be a god. Um, he's the guy who started the great fire of Rome. Most historians believe started the great fire of Rome burning over half his city to the ground because he wanted to blame it on Christians because he wanted the Roman Empire to hate Christianity. And, 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 then, and, then, and then in the end, what he really wanted was a golden house because he was a god, and if you're a god, you should live in a golden house. But to do that, he had to get rid of part of the city so he could erect this golden palace to himself. And here's this guy, good old Nero, and literally just a handful of blocks down the way in a dungeon is, is a rabbi, former Pharisee, let's just say it that way, a former Pharisee who now follows a renegade rabbi from Nazareth, who by the way is dead, and he's chained in a dungeon underneath the ground, and somehow that guy is a threat to the emperor who thought himself to be a god. And in this context, knowing he's about to be put to death, he writes this. Paul wrote in verse 6 of chapter 4, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, Old Testament reference, we don't have time to go down that path today, but then he says this, And the time of my departure is at hand. In other words, it's a fancy way of saying to Timothy, Timothy, I'm not long for this world. I'm going to die soon. And then this is kind of his last will and testament, if you will. This is, a, he is, this is his, there are three statements, if you will, about his life and the journey and how he has journeyed because God has been with him. And it's just three quick statements. He says, I fought the good fight. I've run, or excuse me, I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. Three statements. The first two are athletic kind of imagery, metaphors, terminology. 
The last one is a military reference. I'll I'll explain in in just a moment. But he says, first, I, I have fought the fight. Now, he was not talking about a conflict. He was not talking about a war. He was he was actually talking about an it was athletic imagery. I know Connor preached on the race last week and 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 did a phenomenal job kind of explaining that element to us. Again, here is athletic imagery being used, but the idea is fight, i.e., agonize, i.e., endure. In other words, he's saying that you're going to have to endure, Timothy. I've, I've had to endure. I've had to struggle through. I've had to fight my way through. I've, I've, there's, this life, in many ways, has been a fight. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write down that there is a part of the journey that has to be endured. Let, let, let me tell you something. If this world is broken, and if this world is not your home, then it's not supposed to be easy. Right? I mean, there's just, there's, there's pain in this world. And, and I'm going to go so far, and, and I'm going to go, I didn't say this in the first service, but I'm going to go so far as to say, God didn't want all of this pain to exist. This pain doesn't add to his creation. It takes away from his creation. God didn't want brothers killing each other. God didn't want a whole world to rise up in rebellion against him. God didn't want the Israelites to forget him. God didn't want war and rumor of war and death and pain and disease and illness and divorce and abuse and aloneness. And the list could go on and on and on. The pandemic of 2020 didn't make God happy. So be careful going down the road of, well, this is God's condemnation upon a people who have. I just, I'm not that, unless your name is prophet this or prophet that, I'd be real careful going down that road. Because it usually didn't end up very well for the prophets either. But I would say this to you. He does send rain on the just and on the unjust, the Bible says. We've had to endure this year, haven't we? My favorite movie of all time. All time. Not Chris, not favorite Christmas movie. Favorite movie of all time. It's a Wonderful Life. Can I get an amen? Is anybody else in that category? Yeah, that's a good one. There's a good one. Well, you're going to clap. Yeah. You know, some of you may know the history of, you know, uh, you know, my granddad used to say it this way. The, the guy that starred in It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart, he would say it this way. They just don't make them like that anymore, you know, and so, and so, but Jimmy Stewart in the late 30s and early 40s was an A-list Hollywood actor. He was the guy. Handsome, funny, could be serious, had a wide range in his acting ability, one of the most skilled artists on the planet at that time. But he had a strong and deep sense of patriotism. In fact, his family, I mean, he had family members who had fought in the Civil War and in the Spanish-American War. I mean, he just, he believed that you served if you went to war. And so World War II was happening. Now, the only problem is he was 33. The average age of someone who enlisted for World War II was between the ages of 18 and 21. And when he enlisted, the army was like, okay, well, we don't want to lose you. Think about the the logic of that. But anyways, we don't want to lose you, so we're going to put you in the film department where you can just make the little short films. So, Because at that time in history, you'd go to the movie theater, and before you saw your picture show, which is what they called it, you would get a little clip, sometimes five minutes, sometimes ten minutes, of footage from about the war or the war efforts. So we want you to do that type of stuff. And he said, not, not on your life. I'm here to enlist as a, in combat. I want to go to flight school. Spent a year in England, which is where a lot of our, this is before the Army and the Air Force were two different, you know, I mean, this is, that's how far back this goes. So he spent, he spent an, a, a year being trained, flew 20 combat missions, barely survived one. 
had the bottom of his plane shot out and had to go all the way from a, a city over Germany where they had been doing a bombing raid, raid all the way back to the base in England where the plane was to land with nothing under his feet in sub-20 degree, t- I mean, it was just 20 below. And, it, and, and for a man who was in his mid-30s, they said the young men in their early 20s, some of them didn't even survive it. It is amazing that he survived it and it caused him physical pain for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, we did not diagnose PTSD until the early 80s in this country, but it's existed as long as war has existed. And Jimmy Stewart returned with severe PTSD. Survived the war, by the way. They made him retire after 20 years of military service. It was uh, past the, uh, uh, the age, you have, there's an age in which you have to retire. So they made him retire at the age of 60. 27 years of military experience. Actually flew in Vietnam. But he comes back from World War II. And he's not acted in six years. And it's time to work again. There's a part of him that doesn't want to work again, according to his biographer, because of the struggles that he and so many had coming back from the war. But you got to get back involved somehow, somewhere, some way. So he comes back. He's an actor, but he's been gone for so long, he's no longer the young, good-looking actor that he once was. People said, his good friends even said, he's aged at least 10, probably 20 years. He looks rough. He looks thin. He looks like a shell of himself. And there were only two films or scripts that were offered to him. The first one was a movie about his time in war. He refused to do it, and he rarely spoke. He he never spoke about combat missions other than to give uh, um, honor to those who had died. And he rarely spoke about the war. The other script was, ironically enough, a film whose title was, It's a Wonderful Life. A film in which every decision throughout the film, the main character, George Bailey, feels trapped. It's like every decision is another nail in his coffin. And there's a moment in the film, talk about dealing with some heavy stuff. There's a moment in the film when the main character, George Bailey, is struggling so badly with life and the pressures of life and and the fact that he's failed over in his mind, over and over and over again. Everything he's done has been a failure. Everything in his life has been a failure. He's let everybody down and he's lost even the business and the money to fuel the business that his dad had built and handed down to him at his death. And, and, And he didn't want it, but he took it anyways. And if you've seen the film, you know that there's this incredible moment where he is literally at the end of himself and he's about to commit suicide. And in the script, Coppola had written, you say this little prayer, and then this angel jumps in the water and, and, you know, it's not good theology, but the angel would get its wings or something if he saved him. But the scene went much differently than it was scripted. Carol Burnett said it was the most powerful piece of cinema history ever. He gripped the rail at the edge of the bridge where he was going to commit suicide. And he gritted his teeth and he began to pray and cry out to God. I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there. Tears began to stream down his face. He was literally weeping for the men that he had lost in World War II. And the hopelessness that their families now experience. The loneliness. They did the shot. They did the scene in one shot. Because he was so emotional. And he would say afterwards just to the crew. I'm sorry I got so emotional, but in that moment, all that I've experienced, all the pain and confusion and why that person had to die and why I had to fail and I couldn't bring him home alive, it just all came out of me at one moment. You know what I feel like 2020 is like? I feel like we're just at the rail. And we're just gripping 
the rail and we're wondering why? How? This does not make any sense. I mean, there's a lot this year that doesn't make sense. That might be the understatement of the morning. And we're just at the edge and we're just gripping the rail. And if we're to be really honest, our hearts are breaking in our chest and we just are going, God, I don't really know if you're listening. But this is, this is not the way it was supposed to go. And Paul had been there. And what Paul wanted Timothy to know is, is that there was a voice that whispered through the chaos. It wasn't an angel that jumped in the water to get its wings. But there is a voice that whispers through the chaos. My presence with you is all the provision you need. There is a voice that whispers through the uncertainty. You can be convinced that you belong to me. You are a child of God. There is this 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 baby who was the savior of the world, all man, all God, all one. And he says, just continue journeying. Just endure a little longer. Continue moving forward. And the reason that he can say that is because it's his story that's being told. And God is not going to let the story end with a pandemic. Or whoever you want or don't want getting voted into office. or a vaccine, or injustice, or addiction, or loss, or a broken heart. God has clearly stated, this is not how the story ends. The George Bailey moment in our life is just, you got to keep carrying on. Not in your own strength, but because you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. His provision is his enduring presence to get you through those moments of life. They're not easy, but you endure them because it's not how the story ends. The story doesn't end with a pandemic. The story ends with God making all things new again. And that's the adventure. That's the journey. That's the destination that we're that we're navigating towards. That's what it means to wander well. That's what it means to live with the highways on your heart. Is Yes, this is a journey, but there's some days and seasons and maybe even years where we're just going to have to endure. This is not how the story ends. Very, very quickly. He said two more things. don't have any time to really do a deep dive on him, but very quickly he said, I've also finished the race. In this journey, I want you to write this down. There's a task that's to be completed. What I'm about to say can sound a bit pessimistic or even dark at first glance. It's not, I assure you. If you think heaven is good, this is not a dark statement. You were put here. I was placed here. We were, we were put on planet Earth. God allowed us to be born into this broken world and he wants us to do something with our life. There is a task or tasks. There's something, listen to me, there's something that God wants you to accomplish. And when you do that, you get to go home. That's life. That's what Paul's saying. It's, 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 did I read that right? Yeah, finished, past tense. I finished the race. I did it. He's not bragging. He's, he's wallowing away in his own filth in a dungeon outside of Rome. He's not bragging. He's going, no, I did what I was supposed to do. I, I did. Now, listen to me. I, I know I'm, I, I'm in my early 40s. I, uh, hopefully, I got a long life ahead of me. I don't know. Who knows? That's in God's hands. But I do know this. When I was in my early 20s, I had a really long list of important things that I wanted to do with my life. Anybody else been there? That list is a lot shorter now. And I'm not saying that I'm failing and so the things are being taken off the list. No, no, no. no. Uh, hear me on this. Listen to me. Becoming a parent. Leading an organization. Sitting next to somebody while they cry their heart out and 
pray that God would heal their heart. Baptizing somebody. Watching a young man or a young lady realize that God's put them here to have a dream. The list of things that I want to do with my life has gotten shorter because the list of things that matter have got, become more concise. There's a handful of things that matter in life. You know, the greatest joy that you can have in being obedient is to figure out what God wants you to do with your life. Do it. And then you get to go home. When? Whenever he says, come on, let's go. And if that's dark news to you, then you've confused this place with that place. You see? I married way over my head. I mean, man, I married way over my head. Like, like some people, some people say that, and then you're, you, you, you know, you meet their better half, and you're like, no, you didn't, right? Yeah, I, I married way over my head, right? Like I was, uh, I, you know, I, I lived just, you know, small town, USA. My dad was a phenomenal man of God, pastor, and da, 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 da. We, I'm, I was going to be have a great life, do a normal whatever, and then I married a girl who was just like way out of my league. She, I mean, I barely graduated from high school. And all you had to do was turn your books in where I went to high school, right? I barely graduated from high school. And I married a girl who graduated with honors from an Ivy League school while working at another Ivy League school. And she had the whole, she could have done anything she wanted to do in the world. She made a pretty good choice. I've tried to remind her over the years, uh, but the uh, last 18 years or so. But the... But she, she, she looked at me one night. I mean, literally, we were on like our, it's literally our third or fourth date. And I asked her this question. I said, what's your dream? What do you want to do with your life? If you could do anything with your life, what do you want to do with your life? And she said, I know it doesn't make sense because I've got all these other things I could do. I remember what she told me. She said, but at the end of the day, I want to be a mom. And I want to help my children grow up to believe that if God be for them, who could ever be against them? And what a force for his, his good and his kingdom they could be in this world. It's a pretty good dream. It's a really good dream. You know what? That's on our list. It's one of our tasks. That's what we're aiming for. In fact... If when it's all said and done, I think that if I loved my wife well, if I raised my children well, and I served my Savior well, with whatever task he wanted me to do, I think death is just a door of opportunity. And that's what Paul knew. Don't talk about adventure if you're not willing to get to the best part of it. And then he says this, I've kept the faith. Oh, it's the best statement. It's the one that gets the least amount of attention, but it's the best statement. Because he doesn't use athletic terminology anymore. No, no, no. This is, this is military imagery. It's the idea of, of a soldier who has been set in a place and he has been given the responsibility to guard this post. I say he, because in the Roman Empire, there weren't a lot of female soldiers. There were some, but not a lot, okay? All right? Guard this post. And one day, after year, year after year after year of guarding this post, they receive word that they have been honorably discharged. That's the imagery that Paul is using here. Now, what was Paul guarding? He was guarding the gospel message and sound doctrine. In other words, the teaching. He was guarding truth. I have kept, in fact, he didn't use that word about guarding truth later on, but he, earlier on, excuse me, he said, I have kept 
the faith. I have stood guard over this message that has been entrusted to me. I am going to heaven believing more in Jesus than I ever have before. Can I ask a question? Here's a good test. Do you get more sentimental about Christmas with each coming Christmas or less? I've been around people that get less. It's, oh, there we are again. Look at all, and then people have to do this, and they put the Christmas decorations up in June, and you know, I mean, I, they're complaining about this and that and the other. And do you get? You know what I think? I think the more in love with Jesus you are, the more sentimental about Jesus you are. And if you think that that's some weak little thing, one of the greatest theologians and reformers in all of history, Martin Luther. A dad and a husband as well would literally write Christmas songs to his children so they could sing them together and have this sense of being sentimental about Christmas every year. I think that there's something to this thing. I think our hearts should get more tender with each advent that comes and goes, not less. Until one day we get to the end and we go, I just want to wake up in the face of God. That's the adventure. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you have called us to wander well, to adventure, but to adventure in such a way that we endure some of these, and agonize even on some of these tough days, but, 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 and that we finish the tasks that you have for us and we, we believe deeply in the gospel message more than we ever have before. And then one day when it's all said and done, we get to go home. Thank you that the adventure doesn't end with our last breath here. In fact, the story is really only just about to begin with our last breath here. So help us to live redeemed and anticipating the day of restoration. Thank you that, God, you're the one in charge of this story, and you're not going to let it end with a pandemic or death or destruction or disease, but you're going to let it end with all things being made new. And we have that hope today because, Jesus, you were born you put on skin and moved into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The word became flesh because Emmanuel, God with us, we can journey on. And all God's people said this morning, amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate, appreciate it, it, brother. Appreciate it. Blessings. I you. <laughs> Blessings. Were you guys blessed this morning? Yes. Thank you, Brent. What a good way to finish up our series, right? The series on embracing adventurous faith. You and I have been invited on an adventure that we do not want to miss. And if you're here and you know Jesus, as Brent was saying, you are on your way to the heaven country. That is your destination. That is where you and I are going but how good would it be to enter into the heaven country knowing that you had done the things that the Lord had given for you to do? And as long as you're breathing, there's work to be done. So Edgewater Alliance Church, I love you. God bless you. Go get your bag. Go invite somebody to Christmas Eve. And we hope to see you then. Go be the church.